Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome, as always, to today's AIA webinar. We thank you for joining these this year, and we are glad to be able to continue to provide you with these valuable educational opportunities, as you've come to expect for over 30 years. My name is Vicki Strand. I'm your Director of Marketing for Construction Supply Group. As we integrate with the Whitecap team, we are combining to better serve you. Our mutual commitment to being better together and building trust on every job will continue with exceptional service and knowledge of the industry. This week, we would like to welcome our friends from WR Meadows. As a reminder, today's presentation is an AIA-approved one-hour, one HSW credit event. Today, we will learn with WR Meadows on the basics of moisture movement through the building envelope. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We do have everyone muted as to eliminate any noise and distraction and provide a great learning atmosphere. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will be collecting these and addressing them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Now I would like to introduce today's presenters. We have two joining us from WR Meadows. Taylor Wodzinski serves as WR Meadows Architectural Specialist. She has worked for the company for seven years. For the past six years, she worked in the WR Meadows Research and Development Lab, but recently transitioned into the architectural role. Within WR Meadows, Taylor has met many goals, including developing their internal project management program, working closely with sales, and architectural engineering and design clients. We also have Jim Weatherly with us. Jim serves as an outside sales representative for WR Meadows, covering the territories of Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri. He has been with the company for 15 years. Jim has worked extensively with building envelope contractors and third-party consultants. He has a CDT and is an active member of CSI. Thank you, Taylor and Jim, for joining us today. Are you guys ready to begin? Yes, we are. All right. Yes. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you so much to Whitecap and CSG for hosting this event. As Vicki mentioned, my name is Taylor Wodzinski. I hope you're all doing well. On behalf of myself and WR Meadows, we would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. Who would have thought back in March, we would still be sitting in front of our computers and doing everything virtually. Today, I will be presenting on basics of moisture movement through the building enclosure. Before I get into the actual presentation, I would like to give a brief of introduction of who we are and what we can offer. A little background on WR Meadows. We were established in 1926 in Elgin, Illinois, right outside of Chicagoland area. We are a single family owned company. We currently have 12 facilities, 12 facilities in North America and three in Canada. We also have a sister company called Blue Ridge Fiberboard that sound, sells sound dampening products. We are currently celebrating our 95th year of business. These are the manufacturing and warehouse facilities in North America. The yellow dots indicate manufacturing facilities and the gray dots indicate the warehouses. We are here all over North America to service you. WR Meadows designs, manufactures, and markets high quality building materials for today's construction professionals. We started with the asphalt expansion joint and we still manufacture it today. If you look across our family of products, we have division three products, which would include your expansion joints, concrete restoration, construction liquids, and decorative concrete. Our second division and known as your division seven products or building envelope products would include your vapor retarders, air barriers, and waterproofing. We currently have grown it into 350 other products. This presentation is an AIA accredited presentation and all the registered architects are able to collect a learning point for it. Let's get into the basics of moisture movement through the building enclosure. 
Today, we are going to identify moisture movement through the building enclosure, review factors of uncontrolled moisture movement into and out of our structure, identify products used in the prevention of moisture movement, consider key design details for the prevention of moisture movement, and discuss best practices and solutions for the prevention of moisture movement for the entire building enclosure. This presentation was designed to address the entire building enclosure. This is a basic presentation, so we will not be getting extremely technical. I think it's important to understand that all phases of the building envelope and enclosure must work together. The under slab, the below grade waterproofing, and the above grade air and water vapor barrier systems have to work together to be continuous and compatible to give us the complete protection for our structures that we need. This slide discusses moisture movement. Moisture is everywhere around us. So how exactly can this affect our structures? Let's think back to our science elementary class. We are all part of the hydrological cycle, the never ending cycle of evaporation from open water and condensation to produce clouds and precipitation in the form of your rain, snow, sleet, or hail, and the dissipation of rain by runoff back into your open water and through the soil. It then flows back into the ocean where it will once more evaporate. The cycling in and out of the atmosphere is a significant aspect of weather patterns here on Earth. Dew point temperature is never greater than the air temperature because relative humidity cannot exceed 100%. Our buildings interrupt this natural cycle, so we must understand how moisture moves and how to accommodate it. Over time, moisture intrusion moves 70 to 90%. Vapor diffusion is 10 to 30 as shown. This study shown was performed in Florida. They basically took a four by eight sheet of gypsum board and ran it through a heating cycle through direct vapor diffusion. One third of cup of water ended up coming through. That's not a lot of water, right? If you were then to multiply that by 500 sheets of gypsum board, that would be a significant amount of water. If you were then to punch a one inch hole in that board and multiply the amount of moisture by 100, that's 30 quarts of water coming through your building enclosure. By looking and understanding this study, air transport is responsible for moisture intrusion in our structures. Hey Taylor, let me jump in right there. Uh, I'd just like to follow up on that point. Uh, we've, and I think I did this presentation a few years ago with this group about uh, detailing air and vapor barrier systems. And, and that's why uh, it's important for every manufacturer to focus on the details around the windows, around the, the base of the wall, the connectivity with the roof and things like that. Because uh, just as Taylor said, one small opening in that uh, building envelope can uh, actually produce quite a bit of uh, moisture movement through the structure. Now that we have looked at moisture, let's look at air leakage and how everything ties in together. Look at the graphic on your right. Look at all the one inch holes. Look at all the areas for air leakage. So what exactly is air leakage? It can be basically be defined as the flow of air through gaps and cracks in your building enclosure. This can be from leakage from the outside in or from the inside out as a result of different pressures. Looking at it from the standpoint of a multi-story building, there can be a number of different pressures that can result in air leakage, whether that be your wind, stack, and mechanical pressures all resulting in air leakage if there are any holes. And holes in a building, there's going to be one or two. As the diagram shows, air will flow any possible way that it can get in. That airflow is not a straight line and it will find a way to get in. When looking at uncontrolled air leakage in a cold climate, there can be a significant amount of heat loss as warm air is displaced by the colder air from the outside. Also, air leakage of warm, moist air from the interior to the exterior can lead to condensation within the envelope, as we had mentioned when discussing dew points. Not only can there be deterioration of your materials, but also there can be reduced insulation performance depending on your type of application. So what exactly can moisture intrusion do? With uncontrolled air infiltration or exfiltration, moisture is always introduced at this point. The occasionally devastating effects and positive benefits are moisture intrusion damages your equipment, your furnishings, and finishes. Air intrusion raises your energy costs and affects your HVAC longevity. On the right are examples of what moisture intrusion can do to your structures. 
Along with air control, there are other issues. Water control. As we talked about earlier, this is the most important control layer from the standpoint of moisture control. An important part of the water control layer, or known as the geotextile drainage layer, aids as a capillary break. This is, reduces your hydrostatic pressure on your waterproofing membrane and helps route water away from your structure. The drainage layer also can serve as a protection layer. All these combine to help prolong your membrane service life. The sources of water can include rain or groundwater or wet materials enclosed, whether that's from your environmental conditions or from actual construction. This water needs to be controlled and allowed to get out. This can be accomplished by the incorporation of materials to allow deflection of water, for example, eaves, or layering of materials in order to shed this water out. If any water gets in, it needs to be allowed to get out via your drainage. For example, this is why we use flashing materials, whether this be from the cavity or openings within your assembly. Incorporation of a drainage space not only allows for water to get out, but it can provide the ventilation and airflow to promote drying of the materials within your cavity. Other components of this liquid control layer are the provision of capillary breaks to provide a disconnect between your materials, for example, your airspace in a cavity. And also, very importantly, is the incorporation of a waterproofing system that consists of a moisture-resistant material within your assembly. This can either be your membrane or material that is installed on the structural component of your assembly. The other way moisture can move is vapor. When looking at designing to incorporate vapor retarders, again, this would be dictated by code, but one should understand and how everything is being incorporated with one another. There's three different approaches to this. There's your flow through your assembly, assembly with a vapor control layer, and control the surface temperature to prevent condensation we can move dew point out of our structures. Water is going to get into our structures, it's inevitable. So let's design them with drying capabilities. Theoretically, air leakage is very easy to deal with. You just simply have to stop the flow. But realistically, that's easier said than done. Just think about how many openings, transitions, materials, and changes of plane are within a typical building and then come up with one system that can provide the continuity. So what do we want out of our air barrier systems? In addition, these materials must be capable of withstanding positive and negative wind fan and stack pressures. They need to be durable and continuous, keeping all your joints, laps, and seams airtight. Be flexible in the nature to allow different substrate movements, expansions, and contractions. In other words, they need to be able to stand up to the conditions that they are going to be exposed to. So what do you choose when there's so much on the market today? Consisting of your sheet goods, mechanically fastened membranes, your fluid applied membranes, and of course, polyurethane spray foam. All these, when installed correctly, can function as an air barrier within your wall, and depending on the type of material, can also function as the other control layers in your wall. For example, a self-adhesive asphalt membrane is a liquid, air, and vapor control layer within an assembly. Starting with self-adhered sheet membranes, they come in permeable and non-permeable. Most non-permeable will require a primer and most permeable will not. The benefit would be a uniform thickness. However, as you can see, penetrations are difficult to address. There is also fluid applied. Fluid applied are monolithic and easy to detail. They are applicator dependent for factory thickness though. There are so many different chemistries available from acrylics to polyether, STPE, and silicones. There are many options available. It's important for you to pick the appropriate products available for your specification. In the bottom right, you will see foam. Foam is known as the holy grail, but it absolutely does come with a price. And now mechanically fasten. This takes up a big part of our air barrier industry. If you look at the Dow Thermex photo, all those seams need to be addressed. This is still an effective way to do an air barrier. However, it will not be if it's not detailed properly. Okay, quiz time. Which one of these is not an air barrier? Because that gum wall is looking really promising. Surprisingly, they are all air barriers. 
This slide illustrates that almost any construction product can be an air barrier, even the gum wall. There are many products that can function as an air barrier. Air barriers need to be strong, so they need to be capable of withstanding positive and negative wind, fan, and stack pressures, and they need to be durable and continuous, keeping all your joints, laps, and seams airtight, and finally, resilient. So it needs to be flexible, compliant, and allow for different substrate movements, expansions, and contractions. Now, let's get to below-grade waterproofing. Designing and using products to keep water out of our facilities, whether that be a balcony deck, plaza deck, or multifamily. There are a lot of different places that require waterproofing. Drainage is just as important. It's a critical issue that you must deal with. Being able to remove water away from your structures can aid in a successful waterproofing installation. The presence of water and its liquid form around a structure can be from numerous sources. In order to select a system that can control water penetration, it is important to consider all of your sources. These sources would include your water table, so the depth of it needs to be determined and understood, and site drainage. Is there naturally occurring site drainage? Or do alternate drainage methods need to be addressed? Something to consider is the fine grained soils can draw water away from considerable distances. Both of these can be determined by a soil report. Another factor to consider is the irrigation system. When designing a structure that incorporates this, it is important that the waterproofing and drainage system can accommodate for the extra water that will be present as a result of this. And then of course, there's cracks in your concrete. As we have mentioned, they are a prominent part of concrete. It's going to crack. The location of these cracks can somewhat be controlled by the design of your concrete. However, there is also the possibility for cracking to occur that has not been accounted for. Water can enter through those cracks, so it's important for the system to be designed to accommodate cracking. And no matter how good everything is, waterproofing details are a major factor that control everything. If your detail is lacking, water will find its way in. Hey Taylor, let me jump in there again. Um, just to kind of follow up on that point, the main thing we see when we have to go chase a leak uh, at a structure is it's leaked through the cold joint uh, most times, or uh, for example, precast walls, uh, if those joints aren't treated correctly. Uh, the detailing and all those little um, changes of plane and anytime there are joints is critical. Uh, it's kind of a, a common sense point, but it gets missed a lot. And if uh, nine times out of 10, if we're chasing a crack, uh, or chasing a leak, I'm sorry, it's it's uh, due to water infiltrating a crack um, that was either planned to be there or, or not there and just because it wasn't detailed correctly. As I mentioned, most of the substrates we use in waterproofing are concrete. Each of these have their own issues that need to be addressed. On the right is cast in place concrete with an expansion joint with fin complications. Precast concrete is taking a larger role in our industry. Issues with precast would be how is your surface? How do joint lines up? Concrete needs to be properly consolidated. Concrete block shown in the center. Yeah, technically this is an above grade application, but it still illustrates issues that you may run into. Another thing to consider with concrete block that it does not offer the same liquid waterproofing coverage rate as cast in place concrete. Shockery is normally used in blindside applications with zero lot lines in urban areas. We are seeing it more in a freestanding wall where instead of building a full form and pouring concrete into it, concrete contractors are building a one-sided form and shooting shockery against the wall to create that wall. And lastly, plywood. Plywood is used on balconies and multifamily. However, it faces many issues with more joints and more flexibility and more potential to rot. Each substrate has its own issues that need to be addressed before and during your waterproofing system installation. A couple of factors that determine the extend water penetration. Concrete, as we know, is permeable. Permeability is generally influenced by the cracks in your concrete. Cracks interconnect flow paths and increase concrete permeability. Increase in concrete permeability due to the progression of these cracks allows for more water and more aggressive chemical ions to penetrate into your concrete, facilitating deterioration. The lesser the permeability, 
the more durable your concrete is going to be. And concrete is porous, so the porosity deals in a major form of vapor barriers. The biggest factor is the water to cement ratio that has been designed with, because you might have a water cement ratio of 50. A lot of the water is used for placement convenience. It allows for us to finish up the concrete and put it into the desired places. When that water leaves so, if there's still a lot of remaining water, it will increase your, your porosity of your concrete and that does become a concern. So what can happen? Water intrusion can damage your interior furnishings, carpet, and equipment. While all of that is very serious, but most importantly, it's telling us that there is water in our structure. Water intrusion can create structural damage. If you have liquid water, normally your building is not habitable. Water infiltration is a leading factor in post-construction litigation. Let's not be this guy with his hands on his head because of our waterproofing system. So how do we select a waterproofing system? There's not one waterproofing system for every single situation. There's many systems available and different levels of protection. It's important to differentiate between dam proofing, waterproofing, and vapor proofing. In considering of levels of different protection, this is the definition of dam proofing. Dam proofing is the water resistant material in the absence of hydrostatic pressure, meaning there's not really water pressure on your wall or structure. Dam proofing will provide you the protection that you are looking for. Waterproofing is the water resistant material in the presence of hydrostatic pressure. If you have water buildup, you will need to use waterproofing. Waterproofing provides the protection of both a structure and a space that gives us the life cycle as desired. If you want to protect your foundation, waterproofing is absolutely worth the investment. Hey Taylor, let me make a point there again. Um, and the, the slide shows a gentleman doing some horizontal waterproofing. Um, notice that we make the, or we use the phrase, it's water resistant. Um, we try to emphasize the point on these job sites that none of our waterproofing systems, and I think most of our competitors would probably agree that, you know, our, our idea of waterproofing is to shed water away from the building, not to basically build a pond or a liner, unless you're a liner manu manufacturer, of course. So, um, this gentleman is doing a horizontal slab and one thing we always like to remind people is to create a positive slope uh, on those type of structures. Uh, I know Taylor's talking more about foundation walls at this point, but uh, just understand that any any waterproofing system is still going to need to be shed uh, away from the building. So how do we choose and what exactly is available? Many options are similar to above grade. There's your sheet membranes, your fluid applied membranes, cementitious membranes, and blind side and under slab. Self-adhesive membranes consist of a polymeric waterproofing membrane or known as rubberized asphalt with a high density polyethylene carrier sheet. There are some variations in these systems such as differences in thickness or carrier sheets depending on the type of application. For example, when one of these materials is used with an asphaltic wearing course, the material is slightly thicker. Instead of a polyethylene carrier sheet, they have a heat resistant polypropylene carrier sheet to resist the heat of the asphalt. These systems can be applied both horizontally and vertically, and the application does include a substrate primer or adhesive that is applied prior to your membrane. They are fully adhered, so it's fully bonded to your substrate preventing the channeling of water in behind your membrane that can potentially happen if a system were loosely laid. It has a factory controlled thickness, so there's no reliance on an applicator of the material to provide the specific applied thickness. It has a factory salvage edge, so it addresses the overlap and the edge of the membrane, which provides continuity of your system. It has a high resistance to hydrostatic pressure. It has high chemical resistance, which resists attack from many naturally occurring chemicals. It's important though that you reach out to your manufacturer to ensure that the material will be able to withstand the conditions that it's going to be applied under. It's cold applied, so it eliminates the need for heating equipment and danger from hot materials. It's easy to apply, so once the substrate is prepared, it is then primed. The backing is then peeled off during your application, and some will say it's similar to applying wallpaper. The membrane is then rolled, and many penetrations and terminations are detailed with a compatible mastic. 
It provides excellent elongation and flexibility, so it addresses your movement, your crack bridging, and small cracks. And lastly, it's compatible with a number of substrates. It's important to ensure that the substrate is relatively smooth to ensure full bond of your membrane. Many of the characteristics of torch-on systems are similar to self-adhesive systems and include that it's fully adhered cohesive system, so it has full adhesion of the membrane to your substrate. It has that same factory controlled thickness, it's flexible and has excellent elongation, it has good resistance to chemicals and hydrostatic pressure. It provides excellent joint detail since the membrane is heated so that it is flowable. There really are no joints in this system and it provides good continuity. Although it's a very good system, it's very dependent on your applicator, more so than any type of system. The applicator needs to be fully trained and aware of the safety concerns that arise when using this open flame. In addition, it's important to heat the membrane to a certain temperature so that it is flowable. At this point, application on a vertical surface can be quite tricky, horizontally not so much. The downside to using torch grade membranes is the fire hazard. And now there's fluid applied membranes. Hot fluid applied has been around for years. Cold fluid applied really has evolved in the last 15 years. Let's dive into hot fluid. Hot rubber waterproofing systems consist of a rubberized asphalt compound. Hot waterproofing forms a strong, flexible, and monolithic waterproofing membrane that adheres virtually to any surface, even rough or uneven surfaces. Once applied, it is monolithic and free of seams. Also, very importantly, it is watertight, so it eliminates that water migration. It offers a strong protection because of the method of application. It is typically applied by a certified or approved waterproofing specialist. They are fully trained in its application and aware of all the safety concerns when using a hot system. A typical okay. application... Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. No, you're going. Oh, I know. I was just going to jump in there and, and mention. Uh, I think most of us in the industry would agree that the hot fluid applied systems are probably by far and away the best system, just because of the bond you get to the substrate. Um, like the torch systems, they're um, somewhat uh, can be somewhat hazardous just because it involves a, a hot kettle and the, the membrane that they put down is typically around 300 degrees. But uh, just based on the bond to the concrete. I think we all would say that's probably the best system out there. A typical application consists of priming your surface first. The product is then applied in layers. The first coat of hot liquid rubber is applied. Then the fabric reinforced sheet is then quickly and firmly pressed into that hot layer. Then a second coat of hot liquid rubber waterproofing is applied. Because of the reinforcing fabric, the elasticity is low. And because it is hot, you need to be very careful. Again, the best is to have it applied by a certified specialist. Reinforcing fabric is added to allow the second layer to become integral with your first layer. More importantly, this is the second layer of membrane was used to address pinholing that was seen to occur in membranes during their introduction phase. Initially, hot rubber membranes were applied in one coat at 180 mils. Too much moisture was getting into the concrete, resulting in pinholing and failure of the membrane. Now cold applied. Cold applied does not require special equipment and eliminates from high temperature material on your job sites. This has been considerable evolution in product technology too, from basic asphalt solvent cutbacks, to emulsions, to polymer modified emulsions, to polyurethane solvent cutbacks, to STPE and moisture care. It can be applied horizontally and vertically, and some are very low odor and excellent for renovation and sensitive areas. These products can be applied to green concrete, which is an advantage over hot applied systems. Many cold fluid applied systems can be applied in as little as 72 hours and some as little as 24 hours after forms are being removed depending on your conditions. Here are some photos of cold fluid applied applications. Horizontal application where you can see the joints and drains have been detailed. On the top right is an application of a planner box. It shows a good example of a monolithic membrane that cold applied gives. On the bottom right is a reinforced cold applied system. A layer of the membrane is followed by a polyester fabric is put in to build your strength. 
followed by another layer of material to provide a premium waterproofing system. On the bottom left, it shows a monolithic installation of a cold applied system with no seams and very smooth surface, which gives you that excellent waterproofing installation. I wanted to touch on blindside under slab waterproofing systems. These are materials that can be applied prior to your concrete pour. Traditionally, positive side waterproofing are put on after your concrete is placed. Blind side is prior. In urban areas, generally they do not have the room available on the outside to place the waterproofing, so they use blind side applications. Additionally, you can use blind side in applications and under slab applications as well. Because these materials are designed to flex and move, it's important to protect them. Protection takes place in two different forms. Protection boards are used exactly what their name implies. You protect the membrane against the potentially damaging effects from your backfilling operations. The second form is prefabricated drainage layer that allows water to drain down your surface into the drain and be let away from your building. It's important to understand that there are different types of products depending on your flow rate and how that can affect the height of your wall and compressive strength. Is this an area that has a lot of foot traffic? It's important to consider compressive strength as well and the type of soil that could affect your choice. All in all, it's important to choose your drainage systems wisely. After discussing a number of waterproofing membranes that are applied from the positive side of the wall, it's time to move on to cementitious waterproofing materials. These are materials that can be applied on either side, whether that be positive or negative. There are two main systems that fall in this category, crystalline waterproofing and flexible cementitious coatings. Crystalline waterproofing create a chemical reaction with our concrete to seal and fill micro cracks, capillaries, and some voids to increase the waterproofing ability of your concrete. Newer technology is the flexible cementitious waterproofing materials. These products are a polymerized cementitious mortar because they are breathable and they can be applied to positive and negative side applications. They're UV resistant and durable. With both cementitious waterproofing, surface prep is critical to a successful application. There are a number of areas where crystalline waterproofing can be used, positive and negative, would include the following, of your waterproofing of foundations, slabs and walls, water storage tanks, potable water tanks, elevator shafts, parking garages, basements, secondary containment structures, and swimming pools. Cementitious waterproofing can be used in most concrete applications. On the top right is a potable water tank that was being resurfaced. On the bottom right is a secondary containment above wall that is being coated. On the bottom left is an overflow tank for a storage system. In all cases, surface preparation is critical to a successful installation. If you do not prepare properly for these products, you will have a problem. So a quick transition from waterproofing to underslab. Soil will always constitute a constant moisture source. Soil below grade maintains a nearly 100% relative humidity. High humidity or vapor pressure always seeks equilibrium, which means from high pressure to low pressure. Consider interior spaces are conditioned and basements are typically dehumidified. Therefore, vapor drive through a medium such as concrete would be inevitable. So what exactly does all that mean? Typically, below grade conditions of 55 degrees and 100% relative humidity produce about 30 PSF vapor pressure. Typically, interior condition space is 70 degrees and 30% relative humidity, which produces about 15 PSF vapor pressure, which is about half. This means 15 PSF vapor drive from the below the slab are coming into your structure. So what does that exactly mean? That means 10.16 gallons are coming into your building enclosure, and that is some serious amount of water. So what does that do? Waterproofing of the underslab can be as critical to the success of a building as waterproofing below grade walls. This often overlooked component has led to, led to a tremendous amount of damage through moisture entry in both liquid and vapor form. Moisture enters the concrete slab at all the usual suspected areas, 
such as your openings, your joints, penetrations, and cracks that form over time. Some of the problems can be flooring adhesive failure, warping, blistering, discoloration, deterioration, delamination, and of course, mold and mildew. No material is considered a true barrier. Given enough time and pressure, the best a material can be considered from a water vapor patch stitch standpoint is a retarder. Retarder is becoming the standard description. Barrier is a marketing term that some of our manufacturers use to try to separate themselves from our competition. Wouldn't you prefer to have a barrier over a retarder? Currently, ASTM E 1745 and ASTM E 1643 only use the term retarder. I want to discuss vapor barriers and vapor retarders. Low grade can have high percentage of post-consumer recycled materials, which means lower strength and permeability due to the heat cycles during the processing and the varied resin types. Recycled resins can degrade from chemicals in your soil, plus regular polyethylene materials can degrade under alkaline conditions. Construction grade films known as CNA or VisQueen are typically produced with very low grades of polyethylene resin and a very high percentage of post-consumer recycled materials. The numerous heat cycles and the reprocessing of recycled materials combined with the varied resin types of used cause inconsistencies in your physical strength and your permeability. While this commodity film serves a purpose in temporary construction and your agricultural applications, it is not designed to provide ongoing protection against unwanted moisture. Film characteristics such as low strength and poor resistance to decay should be of major concern. So what do you want out of your vapor retarders? Because of course you want lower vapor permeance because lower is better. However, you shouldn't have to sacrifice your puncture strength. These products are placed on the ground and concrete is then poured over them. You want to choose products that will be able to withstand construction site demands. As mentioned on the slide, our ASTM standards commonly used for vapor retarders. ASTM E 1993 is a bitumous spec. If it's not bitumous, it will not meet the specification. ASTM E 1745 is plastics, usually your polyfin, and these three different classes are differentiated by strength. The permeance is the exact same in all three classes. ASTM E 1643 is a standard practice for selection, design, installation, and inspection of vapor retarders. ACI are guides. They do not specify anything. They are not an ASTM standard. Membrane placement for vapor transfer prevention provides a means for water of convenience or your bleed water to exit freshly placed concrete in order to minimize the potential for your slab curling and your plastic shrinkage cracking. Extended periods of time between placement and finishing operations. It provides protection for the vapor barrier material from your job site traffic and abuse. Arguments against this would be your increased drying time of your slab to obtain recommended moisture content levels for the installation of your flooring systems. Vapor retarders are still very easily damaged despite having a cushion of sand and or gravel to protect them. Proper water and cement ratio and curing procedures prevent your slab curling and your plastic shrinkage cracking. Hey Taylor, let me jump in there on the, on the blotter layer. Uh, I don't wanna go down a blotter layer rabbit hole because I know there's a lot of different opinions out there on that, but I think most flooring companies who do tile and you know other things like that would probably argue against a blotter layer just because of the tendency for blotter layers to store and trap that moisture. Um, ideally, we want a significant amount of moisture in the concrete for it to cure chemically, uh, but if that concrete essentially bleeds down, I guess for lack of a better phrase, to the, the sand, which we typically put on top of the vapor barrier as a blotter layer, uh, it can sort of get trapped in that sand and never really make it out of that concrete uh, except through uh, evaporation, which kind of wreaks havoc on the flooring system. So just something to keep in mind about that. Here are some typical installations of ASTM E1745 vapor retarder applications. Do you notice that the rebar is in place and all those penetrations are taped? This may be the time you wanna have your manufacturer rep come out and confirm that everything is going to plan so you receive the installation as desired. So what exactly influences our product effectiveness? Key factors affect the system include the design, 
your materials and workmanship, and quality assurance. Although good design and quality materials are essential, poor installation and substandard workmanship, along with a lack of job site inspections, can completely destroy the system you worked so hard for. It's worthwhile to hold your air barrier specification, making sure the products you researched and selected are the ones that are used. In creating your specification, take a look at the product's conformance to ASTM standards. Select a product that has a proven track record, and whenever possible, select an entire system to ensure compatibility, and in some cases, your warranties. If you decide to use two different products together, for example, one manufacturer's sheet membrane and a different manufacturer's transition membrane, please make sure that they are compatible with one another. So which one would you choose for this project? Some designers prefer liquid membranes whenever possible while others prefer sheet. Some say liquid membranes provide more thorough coverage and penetrating hard to reach areas. Others say that the overspray will damage your surrounding building components or neighboring buildings or possibly your vehicles. In short, there is no one right formulation for every single job. On a job like this, pictured here, a liquid membrane makes application much easier around all those brick ties. Others say sheet membrane are a better choice because they are assured that the membrane thickness would be consistent. Liquid membranes, they worry might be spread too thin. It may be that each has a place depending on your job site conditions. Please be aware when comparing product to product that no two products are identical. Coverage rates and mill thicknesses will vary. Before I wrap things up, I need to address pre-construction meetings. Pre-installation meetings are crucial. Require them within your specification. Ensure everyone is involved and identify everyone's responsibilities. It's better to discuss things ahead of time instead of walking on a job site. You can stop problems at this point instead of being in a potential nightmare. Mock-ups are perfect guides to pinpoint potential issues as well. Hey, too, let me jump in there. We've, we've talked about this uh, in other presentations. I can't stress enough how important the pre-installation meeting it is, whether it's for below grade or above grade, just getting all the parties together, particularly above grade with the air barrier system, you know, getting the, the window guys and the roofers and, and uh, you know, the air barrier uh, manufacturer and contractor all in the same room just to answer questions about compatibility, chemical compatibility, um, scheduling, and just any kind of uh, substrate questions, you know, people might have as far as gaps and the, you know, the, the building might have as, as far as in the, the sheetrock and things like that. Just anything you could think of relating to the building envelope and, and how it pertains and interacts with the other trades is just a good idea to get all those people together uh, if you have a, a schedule of time to do that. In summary, control of moisture movement and air leakage is critical to long-term building performance. Select materials and systems based on project requirements and climate conditions. Consider the design and installation of these materials to ensure continuity. This concludes the AIA portion of this presentation. Thank you for your time. I appreciate each of you taking your time of your day to be with us. We would love to be your resource for building envelope needs. Now, can we address any questions you may have? Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we will go ahead and get some questions going here um, that have come through to us. Uh, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane as we start to go through these. Um, there is a question, uh, question on capillary barrier. Building envelope literature mentions use of one between base of foundation and top of footing, but we seldom see this detailed into a project. Should we be showing it? Uh, let me address that, Vicki. I, I think what that question is referring to um, is a gravel base uh, creating a capillary layer around the base of the foundation. And I think the area you're talking about would be, for example, the face of the footing. Um, in all of our drawings, we want the drain tile at the lowest point possible. So I think all of our drawings by, by memory uh, show the drain tile at the base of the footing instead of like on top of the footing. And a lot of times people will stop the, that gravel layer um, 
on top of the footing and, and don't continue all the way down and tie it in with the drain tile, which sort of defeats the purpose. If you can't run your capillary layer uh, with gravel or, you know, uh, we make a product called Mel Drain and, and other manufacturers make a, a drain board that goes against the waterproofing membrane uh, to protect it and then also provide a, a drainage layer or a capillary break layer there. If you don't tie that into your drain tile and carry that all the way down, um, you have potential issues with water just sitting there with no place to drain. So I hope that addresses the question. I think that's what that question was referring to. Great, thanks Jim. Uh, some more here. Um, we have typically been specifying cold applied waterproofing because of the ability to install to green concrete. Are there any situations where cold applied would not be the best solution? Uh, Taylor, I'll address this one again. If you have any thoughts on it, certainly drop, uh, jump in. I just, um, for everyone listening, I handle our field applications and see a lot of these uh, different scenarios. So I'm not trying to uh, manipulate or monopolize all the time, but um, is there a situation where it would not be the best application? I think the point I made earlier about we pretty much universally in the industry feel like hot applied is the best application. Now, for your application on green concrete, no, I think that's the best application. Most uh, products are moisture cure products, so that's why those are not afraid of uh, a little bit of moisture in the green concrete. Uh, a little bit of moisture in that concrete actually helps the product cure a little faster. And um, so for your application, no, I think that a cold applied product would be the best. Uh, the reason the industry sort of started coming out with more and more cold applied products was because of the uh, risk with the, the hot applied products. And then also like you point out to get on the green concrete a little faster. You can't put the hot applied on green concrete. So um, hopefully that answers that question. All right, I had a clarification on the previous question on the capillary barrier, um, and they were just uh, suggesting that they meant to use a uh, capillary break. So hopefully um, that clarifies that for you, Jim. Yeah, we, we do feel like there should be a capillary break layer there. Uh, if that's, again, I these uh, virtual seminars are, are Awesome, and Vicky has done an incredible job putting this together, but it's tough. I can't <laughs> react with you in, in person, so hopefully I address what you're talking about now. We would always want a capillary break layer there. Um, sometimes it's not shown. Sometimes it's just shown as protection course against the membrane. Uh, we just want a way for hydrostatic pressure to be able to relieve itself, uh, either through uh, gravel or uh, through the drain board continuing all the way down. And if we don't show that continuing all the way down to the drain, that's our mistake. But yeah, you should tie those together just so as you break that pressure uh, against the wall, it has a place to go. All right. Um, can you give some examples of damp proofing products at the foundation? Are they the same applications as the waterproofing method? Yeah, so uh, a lot of our contractors will if they're, they're going to use a, a fluid applied, I'm, I'm sorry, a sheet applied membrane on the on the vertical wall foundation, you always have that tricky uh, detail at the bottom of the foundation on the footing. Uh, if it's a, an earth form footing, which most of them are, um, it's really rough on the face, as you can imagine. And then a lot of times the top is not finished off real smooth. So it's really tough to bring that uh, sheet membrane down the vertical wall and then turn it out on top of the footing like most of our details show. So what we'll do is incorporate either a damp proofing or we would rather probably use our fluid applied uh, waterproofing membrane at that location, coat the face of the footing and then also the top of the footing and maybe turn it up like six inches onto the wall and then they'll bring the sheet membrane down on top of that. That would be a place where we would incorporate a damp proofing or a fluid applied membrane. Um, as a rule, most of us, Manu I would say probably all of us manufacturers, I can't speak for everyone obviously, but would like to get away from the damp proofing below grade. I know it's a, a cheaper product uh, per square foot, but that product, uh, as Taylor pointed out, does not have the ability to withstand hydrostatic pressure and frankly will crack over time. Most of these are just cut back asphalt products and just asphalt emulsions. So, you know, you're basically just putting a thin layer of, of asphalt on the wall, whereas the waterproofing membranes are rubberized asphalt and they have the ability to bridge cracks and it's just a much better uh, application. So, yeah, we would try to stay away from damp proofing below grade uh, if that addresses that question. 
Um, it addresses it. We actually have a follow-up question um, that has kind of come up to that. So while we're on that subject, let's go with when and why do you see damp proofing prioritized over waterproofing at foundations? We really don't anymore. Uh, anytime we see damp proofing on a foundation, it's typically an older spec that's just sort of been handed down um, through the years and, and not changed. Uh, I don't know that we would ever recommend or don't even really see it a lot. I mean, it, sometimes we'll see it above grade on the, the block wall. Uh, some architects would like to use that in place of an air barrier and there's some value there, I suppose. But really, I think a lot of us would just, or most of us would just want to stay away from the damp proof and below grade entirely. All right, great. Um, when using a spray applied air barrier over CMU walls, is it best practice to spray into window openings or transition with self-adhered membranes? That's a great question. That really is going to vary uh, from manufacturer to manufacturer, depending on the type of material you're using. I know that some of the STPEs that are on the market now have the ability to act as the air barrier on the face of the wall, but also be rolled back into the opening. Uh, we have a product without Airshield LSR. Is, I don't think we're supposed to mention our products at this point, but it's a, it's a synthetic rubber product that we have actually on CMU turn back into the opening without any additional flashing uh, because it doesn't contain asphalt. The main thing that most of us as manufacturers don't want to do is have asphalt inside that opening because it's so incompatible, particularly with urethane, but also there's some bleeding involved with uh, silicones. So that's why we'll transition that most of the time with uh, plastic flashing. But it's really going to, it's just going to depend on the manufacturer's details. I think most manufacturers are going to want some detailing, even with CMU, uh, around the opening of that window. All right. Uh, we've definitely got some great questions coming in. We are going to go back to um, a follow-up question again with damp proofing, Jim. So when and where is damp proofing used anymore? We see it mostly above grade now. Not that we don't ever see it below grade, and, and, and you know we're not going to call and, and uh, be critical of your spec if you want it below grade, um, but most of the time we see it above grade uh, in place of an air barrier. It, you know, I've been talking to you guys in the Midwest about air barriers for, gosh, 10, 15 years now. I mean, I know I've done several presentations with this group on air barriers, but there's still a lot of um, misinformation or misunderstanding about air barriers. So sort of the default thing is just to throw some damp proofing on a wall and use it like we have in the past. Um, does damp proofing have a value? Certainly. I mean, you're, it's it's better than nothing on the wall. But we're just afraid of the cracks in the asphalt because almost every damp proofing product on the market is just a cut back asphalt. Uh, but typically, if we see it nowadays, it's more above grade than than below grade. And, and I say see it nowadays. We sell uh, quite a bit of damp proofing, just but over the years we've seen that decline and sort of give way to the air barriers above grade and then uh, fluid applied waterproofing is below grade. All right, uh, insulation is so important. Do you train, certify, and and approve installers. Taylor, I'll take that one too, if you want me to. If you want to jump in here, feel free. But um, at WR Meadows, we will train the installers. Uh, we don't have a quote certification system where we go to like a two day class or anything. What our reps have been instructed to do is uh, vet these installers, make sure they're familiar with an air barrier system, for example, and then go to their facility or a lot of times we'll do it on a mock-up uh, on site and train them on our specific products. Most of the detailing in the industry is very similar with how you treat a window, um, the inside and outside corners, how are you going to tie into other uh, systems such as the roofing and, and the waterproofing, uh, but they're all a little different too. They all have some intricacies based on the materials particularly. So we'll spend time with each one of those individuals. At that point, uh, we'll then write a letter saying, I forget how it's stated that, you know, we don't have a certified program, but we can verify this uh, customer installer is familiar with our systems. And, and at that point, we'd be willing to warranty. So if, if that's the question about us specifically, that's that's how we handle it. You could get a letter from us saying that, yes, this guy's OK, you know, and, and we'll warranty his work. And then typically, I don't want to speak for my other rest, but typically what I try to do then in that case is make several trips to the job site just to. Uh, monitor the work, make sure we're all on the same page, and make sure everybody's happy at the end of the project. All right. 
Um, for every inch of concrete, it takes about a month to dry. Is there any moisture management during construction that needs to be considered as the concrete slab cures, especially if the building is partially or fully enclosed? Vicki, read that. Would you mind reading that again? I think I understand that, but I think we're talking about after the concrete has been cured, is there anything we, we can do additionally? Would you mind reading that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, you bet. For every inch of concrete, it takes about a month to dry. Is there any moisture management during construction that needs to be considered as the concrete slab cures, especially if the building is partially or fully enclosed? Okay. Yeah. Um, it would depend on uh, a few things. The the type of construct. I mean, the type of flooring system that's going on. Um, how you cure the concrete. What you want to do with it down the road. Um, ideally, we would like a film forming membrane. WR Meadows, because we manufacture them, <laughs> would like a, a film forming membrane on that surface or something uh, that could be left on that surface after construction's over. That would uh, provide you some moisture protection to the slab and you know, increase the, I act as a, act as a somewhat of a wearing surface, I guess I'll say. It's sort of a sacrificial service. We understand, though, that if you're going to put a flooring system in um, and if the concrete's not going to be left exposed or we can't just seal that concrete at a later date, that's not possible. So what we would probably recommend at that point uh, is a sodium silicate-based uh, sealer uh, that would act like a film-forming sealer but leaves no film on top. That would give you some decent moisture uh, not as good as a penetrating seal or as a, as a membrane forming cures or sealer but it would give you some ability to withstand uh moisture infiltration in that slab obviously if you've got an open slab out in the open uh the best thing we can do is cover it um and, and the way we would quote unquote cover it with our products would be to uh use a, a cure and seal or something that forms a film Okay, we've got a few more questions here and then we'll um, kind of wrap up. I know, Jim, you had a couple of closing things as well. Um, it says, in your example of the concrete wall with the masonry ties projecting from the surface, has the liquid applied waterproofing adversely affected the bond the ties are to have to the masonry? That's a great question. So you're asking if the ties are coated with the membrane, uh, will that affect the bond? I've never had that question come up. Uh, typically, when we're there, we're looking for proper sealing around those ties and making sure that you know we have a continuous air barrier that's tied into the steel. Uh, I've never had a mason come back and say, you know, these these ties are all coated with a, a rubberized asphalt, for example. It's going to affect my bond. So. I'll probably have to uh, get back with you on that one and just find out structurally if that's an issue or if we've had anybody, uh, any of our reps have been, that's been brought to their attention. I never have, that's never come up with me, but I'm not saying it's not an issue. All right. Well, and as a reminder um, to everybody that is on the call, um, WR Meadows does receive a copy of all the questions that are being asked, but they definitely will follow up um, with you all um, individually. Uh, I've got just a couple more questions here, Jim. Um, for slab on grade structure, is below grade waterproofing, damp proofing at the exterior face of the concrete stem wall required? If using trench footings, would this be installed before or after pouring the foundation? I'm thinking uh, just the 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 initial reaction on the stem wall is no i don't think it'd be required um we typically just want to make sure we provide a positive waterproofing film uh on the outside of the structure it i'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this on a stem wall no i, I just think we want to make sure we keep occupied space uh dry as far as the sequence again i'll have to get back with you on that i, I don't know um i don't know that that matters but um let me look into that too i just Sorry, when we, again, when we talk in person and I can look at your face, we can kind of have a conversation about it, but I'm just kind of trying to think through all the different scenarios of this, and I just want to make sure I answer you correctly, so let me look into that as well. You bet. You'll, you'll, um, I'll let you get back to the individuals that are asking, and there are some that are asking for a copy of the questions with the answers, and so we'll make sure that um, we get these uh, written out for you and back 
um, back to everybody with with the answers. Uh, just a couple more here. Um, are your wall air barrier products compatible with roof system vapor barriers? Vicki, at the end, I didn't, you said, are they compatible with roof to, and then what was that? Roof, yep, roof system vapor barriers. Uh, typically, yeah. Uh, as far as vapor barrier, the biggest problem we have is is asphalt. One of our coatings is asphalt, and some of our other uh, manufacturers uh, have asphalt-based products, which is a problem with PVC, um, is a problem with a lot of different materials um, in the roofing system. So that's the the main reason we have the pre-construction meeting just to make sure we're all on the same page as far as compatibility but uh, typically it's not an issue nowadays but if we see like a PV, pvc roof or something that's a big red flag um just for example so hopefully that answers that all right well um those are all the questions that we've got for right now um jim did you have a last couple of last uh closing comments that you wanted to speak to yeah, I just, and I'm sure Taylor would, would say the same thing. And Taylor, if you want to follow up, that's fine too. I, I want to thank you everyone for attending. Uh, this is kind of new for us. It's uh, not like being a person where we can sort of interact and, and see the reaction on, on everyone's face. And uh, everyone that I've dealt with across the Midwest has always been great about specifying our products. And I get a lot of calls from, from you guys and gals as far as uh, application questions and detailing questions, things like that. Please always feel free to call us. We've got as Taylor mentioned, products for above grade, below grade, concrete, just a, really a full line. And and hopefully uh, you'll remember WR Meadows when you're specifying products. And we thank you for the times that you do specify us. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Taylor, Jim, WR Meadows for providing today's webinar. Thank you all for joining as well. Uh, within the next few weeks, you can expect your AIA credit and your certificate of attendance. Uh, once you exit the webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and everybody would value your feedback in just a few minutes of time to complete that. You will also receive a follow-up email this week with a link to view a recording of today's presentation. Uh, as we had stated, we will make sure that any questions um, that were asked and answered, we would uh, definitely, we will definitely um, get those into the hands of, of Taylor and Jim and, and they will be responding back and, and we'll get those back to you. So on behalf of Construction Supply Group, Whitecap and WR Meadows, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.